Would you please open your Bibles to the book of Matthew? We'll be reading in chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and is in terrible suffering. And Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. The congregation said, Amen. 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 The Jack. Thank you, Phil. Does it look a little different in here? That's because the Spanish are here today. <laughs> I knew you'd think that that was an exciting thing for them to be, get to be here with us and uh, see this place look a little bit more full. So are you guys getting the translation from Edison? I just, is he just singing in the mic or something like that? I figured he's just up there telling jokes or something. <laughs> just so you know, we have headphone translation going on for those who don't speak English and so if you stand there looking confused someone's likely to hand you a headset so but it's been a great week there's been a whole lot of work that's gone on here and there's a lot of thanks that need to be said I know Jackie's going to say a lot at the end and so I think there's a special thanks goes to Jackie for all of the work that he's put in and and way in which he's been able to make things come together a thanks to Jim Arno because the pew you're sitting on wasn't there on this week and it got moved out and, and lots of things happened and it's back and you haven't fallen over yet. So thank Jim that uh, these are all bolted back down now and everything is good and Ted's the one who's painted everything and made it look nice and so there's a, a lot of people to thank for this. Uh, if you're part of the Mo Connect group or we're thinking about coming, we're going to be at the building tonight, so don't bother coming to the Mo's. And the last one is October 29th is a fall festival that we're going to be having. I know Edison has been planning it, the Spanish congregation has been working on this, and we're joining with them in this. This is a whole community outreach to try and invite some of our friends and some of our neighbors. There are some flyers at the uh, Welcome Center, and so if you would like to pick one up to invite some more people, uh, it's going to be a big event and a, a way to be able to do this. So it's Saturday the 29th, and so we're not stopping. There's a whole lot of things that are still going on here. Uh, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about authority and what authority means and who has authority. So who has authority in your life? Who's the one that you feel like tells you what to do and says what you're supposed to be and everything else? Maybe it's you. Maybe you say, I'm in control of my own life. Well, there's an election coming up pretty soon. Who do you want to be the authority for our country? He's the one who's going to run everything and tell everybody what they can do or what they can't do. And who do you want that to be? Well, we get a choice, right? No? <laughs> yeah, we're going to stay off of that one a little bit. 
<laughs> As you know, I'm not political at all. So, But that's not really what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is our own authority and about what happens with us and how do we have respect for authority? How is it we treat this whole situation? We have the police with us here today. And certainly they deserve some respect for authority. If you just go too fast, you'll find out what kind of authority they have. Uh, so pay attention to them. And so there are a number of different groups. Politicians have authority. Police have authority. You know who the worst group of people that seem to have some authority is? The worst group is preachers. I mean, they're terrible. You just look at anybody, and, and it's kind of hard to live with all of that and think about what all they do. And, and the first thing you get is, well, how much have you embezzled? What do you mean? Well, that's what we always hear about them. Otherwise, the news is pretty quiet. But it's always somebody who embezzled, somebody who had fights, somehow there's corruption in the church, he ran off with the secretary, there's affairs going on. And so every time you have that, but isn't that in every job, in every place of authority that we have, really? I mean, you see corruption in all kinds of places, and it hasn't left the church either. There, there's a whole lot of times where people are guilty of things there. And so how do we deal with that? Because a lot of times people will look at you and say, well, I don't have any use for you because I know what you people are like. It's because they don't really understand authority. Some preachers are lazy. I've known a bunch of them. They think they work one hour a week. I know the rest of you think we only work one hour a week, but they seem to think they only work one hour a week. And they're really not good at much of anything. But we do need genuine men of God who are able to speak for God. That's important that we're able to do that. Sometimes police aren't seen in a good light. But neither are plumbers. Neither are used car salesmen. It doesn't matter who you have. There's somebody that you know, cast a bad light on what you're trying to do. So I think it's important for us to understand what authority's all about and understand how it works. And I think maybe this will be a blessing to your life if we can get this. Romans 13 talks about, let every soul be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And so certainly governments, certainly police, Certainly, God has set up everything because God is in control of it all. He's the main one who makes all the difference. The passage that Phil read to us today from Matthew chapter 8 talks about a centurion. And what I want to do is there are two different stories that I want to tell that talk about Jesus today. And so I want to talk about what happens in these two stories with the authority that these people seem to have. As you look at the first one, you find the centurion. Now, a centurion is a soldier. He is a Roman commander. In fact, he has come to the land of Israel and specifically with Jerusalem, and he has conquered it. He owns it. So they occupy that territory now. So he is the military force in that place, someone to respect, someone to be afraid of, because they literally came in and conquered the whole place. So as you look at this, He's somebody that uh, would be a little bit difficult, you would think, because after all, you think about who he is. He's the guy with the fancy hat. He's the guy who commands a hundred men, and if he says kill, they do. Whatever he says do, they do, and if they don't, someone dies. He is commander. And he understands that kind of lifestyle because that's his whole world. That's his whole life. And so when he comes to Jesus, he has a problem. He has a servant who has become ill. Well, what do you do as a commander? Well, you could go capture you a new one, right? I mean, just you got the sword on. You can just go get somebody and say, all right, you're my servant. Uh, maybe you take money and you buy one. Yeah, there's all kinds of things he could do to get a new servant, if that's all he wants is a new servant. But this guy's different. This guy's a little bit different than, than the normal way of looking at things. 
And so he comes to Jesus because he wants his servant to be healed. Now that seems a little bit unusual, don't you think, to come to someone? Especially if you're the commander, especially if you have the sword, here you are, you're the one able to do all this. But he understands, I don't have authority to heal. And I understand there are some people that are over me and some people that are under me. I have a hundred men under me, and I do not have authority to heal. And so I will go to the person who does have authority to heal. And so he goes to Jesus, and he says, my servant lies sick. I'm asking that you would heal him. And Jesus starts to say, okay, I'll go with you and heal him. And, and he stops immediately and says, well, wait a minute. You, you don't really need that. You just have to command. Whatever you say is going to happen. Whatever you say, if you're in authority, you say and things move. And he understood that. And Jesus is so impressed because he understands authority. See, he understands that he's over some people, he's under some people, and he knows exactly where his place is. And so if he needs someone or needs help with something, he's going to go to that person who is in authority. So as you look at that, he also understands I've got responsibility. I've got people who are under me. And so he's going to be able to take care of those people as you, as you look at what he's doing here. And so with all of these different things, you can see how he's the commander. He's able to do these things. And he comes to Jesus to be able to respect Jesus. He says, you don't need to come to my house. All you have to do is command. And Jesus is so impressed. He says, I haven't seen faith like this in anybody because he understands God's over everything. He understands Jesus is over him. He understands he commands. He says, if you just say the word, things happen. That's how a man of authority lives. What an incredible thing it is for him to be able to do this. And I think sometimes we don't always get this. Does Jesus have authority? Sure. Because nobody heals like him. Nobody teaches like him. Nobody can do those things. And so we understand that. But I think sometimes we misunderstand authority because we don't realize that's true of us as well. We have some responsibilities and some people we are over. Maybe it's a two-year-old and you are struggling even with that. It's hard to be over a two-year-old. It's really hard to be over a cat. I mean, you can command a cat all day long and they're not going to do anything. That's one of the hardest things. But we are over some things, over some people, and we are under some others. Put yourself in the right place is all he's saying. And above all that, put God in the right place and understand what place he has. Well, sometimes we misunderstand this and we struggle with this and we don't like this. And I think that's what happens to us. God is the one who created everything, and he created the world complete. It was good. Everything possible in it was good. And then Adam and Eve are introduced to the garden. And sure enough, there's a tree and a serpent. And Eve is tempted. Why don't you eat of the fruit of this tree? And she thinks it'll be good. And so she eats of it and gives to Adam. And then they go hide. Well, they don't hide from each other because I think they hide together. So it's not embarrassment between each other. I mean, there's a little covering going on, but they hide together. So they're not hiding from each other because eh, we're okay with other people who sin like us, right? Right? just not okay with God. And God comes walking in the garden. He says, where are you? He says, I'm hiding. Doesn't that sound like a little kid? Why are you hiding? Um, because we have no clothes. How do you know you have no clothes? Who told you? Did you eat of the tree? And there's a certain amount of shame that goes with this when we know we have done something wrong. 
And so I think sometimes our rebellion to authority and our lack of response to it is because we know we've done something wrong or we would like to do something wrong. Or we're trying to do something wrong and we really don't want anything to do with them. But why would you be afraid? The only reason I know of to be afraid is because you feel like you've done something wrong or you're about to. There's a lot of people today who have no respect for authority. Generally, if they have no respect for God, they won't have respect for anybody. They won't have respect for policemen. They won't have respect for parents. Because all of this goes together. When you learn respect for authority, you learn respect for all of it. And generally, if you don't have respect for your parents, you're not going to have it for your teachers. You're not going to have it for police, and certainly you're not going to be sitting here today as if you have authority, respect for the authority of God. And I think it's one of those things that we struggle with. We rebel against authority because we think it limits us. There's a real way that authority works in how Jesus interacts with people, and especially in how he interacts with his commander. You see, it shouldn't ever lead to violence. It ought to lead to peace, exactly like this story shows. People gave Jesus authority all the time because they were in need. They had a disease. They had a sickness. They were blind. They were, had something broken. They you know, had trouble in their life, and they needed something. They needed some way for this to be better so that they were able now to, to be free from all these things. And, and there was nowhere else to go. They didn't really have good doctors or anything. And so Jesus is the one hope. And they come to him and they say, heal us. And they put themselves in his hands. And every single time Jesus shows his authority because he does heal them. You see, when they come to God, they're able to heal. Then they listen to his teaching, and he says, this is the way your life is going to work best, and that's the way in which you can see it all happening. Because they understand this is how your life works best, and so they find a way to make all this happen. They trust him. Authorities to take care of. And that's what they thought with Jesus. They didn't come for a lecture, but they came to understand how to live. And they came to understand how they could get past the difficulties in their life. You see, this principle is the centurion comes to him to get help. And he understands there's people under him, there's people over him. And the person in authority is going to find a way to help. Every time we come to God, we can find a way to help. And I think that's one of the things that we're able to see. So how do we make this a little bit practical today? So when, how does this work in a family, for example? If you have a family and they're, you know, you're trying to teach your children respect for authority, does it go something like this? They just don't get it yet, so we talk louder. And they're still not getting it, so we talk louder. And they still don't seem to understand, so we get the volume way up there now and get the gestures going and get the threats going and get the... And it doesn't seem to be helping their respect for authority somehow. Why not? Oh, you get the eye roll. Because they know you can't carry it out. I mean, there's only so much physical violence you can get away with. You know, I'm going to pinch your head off. Did you ever hear that one? I'm going to jerk both of your arms off. Well, I don't think you can do that. I mean, you look strong, but I'm not sure you get away with it. You know, someone would notice when I go to school that I have no arms. And, you know, there's all kinds of threats you start in order to get them to do what you're... That isn't how authority works. Because we have the wrong view of what authority means. And so many times this is people's view of God. That God's going to threaten and if you don't behave and if you don't do what's right, God's going to send you to hell. That's the big threat of God, isn't it? Isn't that what he says? And we don't understand how a family's supposed to work. It's supposed to work exactly like Jesus and the centurion did. 
Because in a family, you have a parent who is the one in authority. And maybe it's mom and dad. Maybe it's just mom. Maybe it's a single parent situation. But somebody's the authority. And what do they do? They take care of. That's what they do. And so they provide food. They provide a place to stay. They buy toys. They do things that are good for you. They protect. They're able to be there in that situation so that they take care of you. And they play with you. And they have fun with you. And they talk to you. And it doesn't really seem like that at all until it gets to one of these kind of situations where they seem like they're, well, what are you trying to do? And we have great respect for the people who would take care of us and provide for us and care for us. And there's a great deal of love for those people. And I think that's what God designed families to be like. It isn't so that they can serve you and God gave you little servants. That isn't really authority. They're supposed to do whatever you want, whatever's your whim, right? You're never going to get respect that way. In fact, the more you do for them, the more they're going to respect you. Authority is about a person who protects and serves. That may be a police motto, but that ought to be a parent motto as well. Authority and respect for authority is understood as someone who protects and serves. And when you need help, they're the ones you go to. And so they know they can be there. So, you know, I grew up in Alaska, and we would go, occasionally go camping. This is an illustration, all right? Now, they have all kinds of modern equipment nowadays where you're able to go camping and you're able to, you know, it, it's fairly easy compared. So we had a tent, and I actually found a picture of the tent that we had online. It was a 10-man army tent. Why four people needed a 10-man army tent, I don't know. It had no floor, of course. Uh, those situations didn't occur back then. And this is the Arctic version since we lived in Alaska. And, you know, you can see all the ropes and the ties and everything else. And there's one pole in the middle. The one pole in the middle is 16 feet long. How does that fit in the station wagon? I mean, you got to tie the thing on top. And this tent was probably four feet wide, four feet square, and a couple feet high. Not anything like the tent I own now. The tent I own now, I think, says you can put it up in three minutes, and it's pretty close. This would take about three days. <laughs> you know, so he would say, all right, we're going to go camping. Let's get the tent out. This tent was made the year I was born. I looked on the inside, and sure enough, I was like, wow, this tent's as old as I am. And so I'm 15, 16, we're going camping. So when you go camping, the incitement and joy is you get to play with fire. By that, I mean that's your whole source of heat. That's how you cook. That's how you're going to heat water. That's how everything happens. And my dad does not believe in taking lighter fluid. So we're going to shave the little things, and we're going to gather the firewood, and we're all going to bring it in, and things like this. Of course, you realize there are no camping spots. You also do not buy firewood. In Alaska at that time, you just pull off anywhere, and uh, we'll camp here, because that's the best you got. And so we would go and we would camp, and, and you're away from town, you're away from all the things, and it's, it was such great fun. Because you get to go out and explore. You get to go climb trees. You get to do all kinds of things. There's water. There's fire. It's so great. So many dangerous things to play with. You get a knife. You get an axe. You get... This is a, just a, such a great joy for a boy especially. I mean, there are so many dangerous things you can do. And, and they actually allow you to do that when you're off camping where there's no possible way to get you back to a hospital. <laughs> right? I never thought my dad is forcing me and he is taking authority over me 
to put me in a situation of danger away from my bed where the temperature is going to be so cold and I'd have to set up my own house, gather the firewood, cook the dinner. This is, and you've always got ashes in whatever it is you cooked. You know how that goes. I never thought of that. Now, since I've married my wife, I understand some people may think of that. <laughs> But I never saw that. I saw that as great fun, as him providing something great. I think some people look at God and say, you're making my life terrible. And God's trying to help you have fun. God's trying to provide such great blessings for you because that is what authority is. You're big enough to provide blessing. And if you're not big enough to provide blessing, then you really don't have authority. But if you're big enough to provide blessing, if you're big enough to have protection, if you're big enough to do things like that, then it can be such a great experience and you don't even think about God's commander. God made everything. It's such a joy to be able to have God. Of course, our camping kind of looked like this at times and I'm not sure that's really the best way things go. My wife has stories. <laughs> but I never really thought of it as anything other than fun. It wasn't about being drug anywhere. Because it was about building a relationship with someone. And about that kind of joy, that kind of enjoyment. And so respect is about character and relationship. And authority doesn't have to be something scary. Authority doesn't have to be something bad. It can be if we choose for it to be. As you look at the situation with Jesus, you're going to see two different things. One is the person who says, you have to do what I say because I said so, which makes absolutely no sense. And then you have Jesus' approach. He says, follow me. We'll do this together. What a huge difference if you have someone going first who really has the authority to back up what they say. You see, there's another story in the Bible that I want to share with you that talks about a different way of looking at authority. And that's the story of Jesus and Pilate. And so when you look at this story in John chapter 19, Jesus is on trial for his life. It says, so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to him, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he, was made, he made himself the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again, and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And so as Jesus stands before Pilate, Pilate's getting pretty frustrated because Jesus won't answer. He doesn't have to. Why should he? He knows what's coming. Pilate can't find anything wrong with him. He can't find any guilt. And Pilate isn't on the plan that they're thinking. They cannot crucify him without Roman authority. And Pilate is the Roman governor there. And so Pilate attempts to release him, but the scribes and the Pharisees who are there and the rulers of the Jews say, no, crucify him, crucify him. And as you look later on, he walks outside and says, why, what has he done? And he, to the crowd and the whole crowd cries, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate talks to Jesus and he says, why, why? I don't understand this. And he won't talk to him. And he says, don't you know I have authority to crucify you or to release you? And Jesus says, no, you don't. He says, you're stuck. You can't do anything. 
How many of us find ourselves in that kind of situation? We want to rebel. We want to claim, I'm the authority here. I have control of my life. I decide who lives or dies. I'm in control of my own destiny. We have lots of phrases that go with it. And Pilate looks at the crowd, and he knows what he's done talking to Jesus. There's no guilt in the man, and the crowd says, crucify him. What do I do? He washes his hands. He says, I find no guilt, and I can't condemn him. Then, but he can't release him. So, Pilate, you don't have any authority. It's going to happen. Whatever God decides is going to happen. And Pilate, you're just standing in the way. And that's the same way it would be with us. People claim to have authority, and they don't have it. They think they have control when they really don't because they cannot make anything happen differently, and they need to go to someone else for help. They need to go to the real authority. So Jesus dealt with a centurion who is in need of help, and he comes and he humbly asks, and Jesus grants, and the servant is healed exactly the time when he asks. And Pilate comes to him and says, I have authority to crucify you or release you. He says, no, you don't. You're just stuck. The only thing you can do is wash your hands. And sometimes that's the only thing we can do as well. Wash. Try to get rid of some sin. Try to go to God. Try to let God forgive you. So Jesus goes to a cross. And the odd thing with all of this is Pilate could not save Jesus. But after the cross... Jesus could save Pilate. What an incredible thing it is. You find later on that Jesus comes to his disciples after his death and resurrection, and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And Jesus says to his disciples, I have all authority because he had conquered death now. Heaven and earth, he's conquered everything that there is. That's all authority. He controls it all. He can heal. He can condemn. He can do any of it. And he calls his disciples in his one wish. He says, I want you to baptize people for forgiveness don't let them stand like Pilate saying, I can do anything in my life I want. You can't even deal with your peers. The best thing you can do is let Jesus wash you so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could go to someone who really has authority, someone who is really able to bless, because that's what authority is really all about. And then he says, I want you to teach them how to obey all my commands. Teach them not just what I commanded, but how to do it. And so that's so very important. I don't think we can claim authority. I don't pretend to be that big. Preachers don't really have any, if you think about it. We just try and explain what God said. But we don't have any of our own. And maybe you'll realize you don't have any of your own either. At least not that much. The best thing you can do is go to God who does have it. So does God have authority in your life? Can he heal your hurts? Can he hear your prayers? Can he comfort you when you're sad? Can he help you when you're depressed? Can he be a blessing in your life? Boy, if he can, what a great thing. If your answer is no, you're still trying to hold on to the fact that you have all authority and you decide Boy, maybe it's time to let God take control. We are a holy people called out of darkness to show forth the glory of an almighty God. He is such a blessing to us, and he gives us our life back. Maybe it's time for you to be forgiven. Maybe it's time for you to take 
your life and let someone who has authority give some control to it. Maybe you can surrender yourself to God today. We'd love to help with that if possible. Would you come while we stand and sing?